Hello there, I am Dr. Regina Kemp and this is the Caring for Aging Parents show. I'm a board certified clinical psychologist and I specialize with older adults and families. I help you manage the most complicated situations with your aging parents so that you have peace of mind knowing that you are doing everything you can to help your parents live their best lives without giving up your own life in the process. This is a very special episode. Today, I have the incredible honor of interviewing MJ Grant about her experiences with caring for her mom with dementia. Mary Jane MJ Grant is a CODA. That's a child of deaf adults. MJ was born to deaf parents and has been a member of the Maine deaf community since childhood. She currently provides sign language interpreting services to deaf communities in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. MJ is also married, caring for aging parents, and parenting four children ranging in age from five to 25. And today, I get to share her caregiving journey with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to talk with me and um, our viewers about your life and your life as um, a person caring for aging parents and a person with a full spectrum of activities in your life. Um, so thank you. It's just like an incredible honor to be interviewing you. So thanks for making the time I for this. Thank you. I'm excited to be here with you because I've been following you for months since we connected and it's been great. So I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, wonderful. Well, so since you mentioned since we connected, um, we connected because I saw your incredible Dementia Can Be Beautiful video, which you had on YouTube. And then I saw somehow on um, Facebook and I like grabbed it and <laughs> like said, oh, this has to be shared with the world. And so then I um, posted it mm -hmm. and then I've been using it when I teach um, different groups that are caring for folks with dementia. And there's not a dry eye in the house when I show the video. And so um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, how you made that video and um, the significance of that video to you and your mom. I, um, yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, when I initially created the video, prior to that, I was already starting to post a few things here and there on my Facebook account. Um, to share about my mom and the experience of her being in a memory care facility because she is deaf, she has dementia. And at one point we did have to move her into a memory care assisted living um, facility. And she was experiencing isolation, even though there were a lot of you know staff there and there were a lot of residents, she was just lonely. And mm. because nobody signed, she didn't have a lot of visitors who were deaf coming to visit her. So she didn't have a ton of interaction with her peers. And I just started to feel every time I went to visit her, she would say, you know, everybody's talking and I don't know oh. what they're saying. And I'm, you know, just sort of left out and it broke my heart. So I started posting videos to not only create awareness, the goal was to, you know, can somebody visit her? Can somebody who uses sign language visit my mom? And so uh, months after that, we basically ran out of money because it's expensive. <laughs> and if you don't have a lot of money, you can't really afford to, to, you know, have somebody in a place like that, you know, if you want really good quality services. And so when we ran out of money, we had to move her back into my house. She had been living with me prior. Oh. So we moved her back into my home. And so she was reacclimating to living with us. And at this point, so when the video came out, it was in January. She had moved in at, uh, the end of December. It was after Christmas. And she hadn't, she hadn't at that point forgotten who I was that I can recall. Um, I don't remember her, you know, looking at me, not being sure of who I was. But I remember mm -hmm. that day specifically when we were driving, I was bringing my daughter to pick up her car that she was purchasing. And I decided my mother loves the beach. 
And I, you know, I, I have this sort of drive to just um, expose her to everything she loved so much, you know, that she really didn't get to experience because of other things I can share with you later. Um, so I really wanted to bring her to the beach and she could, you know, feel that, that sort of healing energy that you, you get at the beach. And while we were driving there, she started talking about me as if I wasn't there. So she was saying my daughter, MJ and Luann. And so I parked the car and I, and I had had the camera running because I started documenting quite a bit um, at that point already. And I was finding a lot of, uh, I don't know, there was a lot of healing coming from just documenting and, and taking pictures and, and, and documenting a story for myself and sharing some of it. So I was already running the camera and, sh and I decided to ask her, you know, where MJ, where Ed and Jay was to see what she would say. I figured she might say, she's right, you're, you're MJ, but she didn't. And so at that point, you know, that sort of started that whole conversation that you would see in the video. And um, it was just such, it was such a sweet moment because when she discovered that I am MJ and, and the, I mean, which she does all the time now, is not uncommon for her to go, oh, I'm so surprised, you know, everything is just such a surprise. But that moment, she just reached out and hugged me, like, oh, my baby, you know, oh. and it was so special. And I never imagined it would get the attention it received. Never. I mean, when I posted it, I thought, okay, my, my friends on Facebook are, are going to see my sweet mom, you know, and, and this sweet moment. But it went, whew, like, wow. As it should. Incredible. Incredible. As it should. And, and I mean. I didn't understand it. At first, I didn't really understand why. I thought, okay, is it because of, you know, the fact that she's deaf? Is it because we're using sign language? Is it because, what is it? And then about a month ago, I looked at it again. And it's been now, I mean, it's been several months now. And I, I think I realized why. You know, it's like, oh, there's something really incredibly special about this moment that the world saw. Mm -hmm. And um, I experienced it to be a little bit different than what the world experienced. And, but in that moment, about a month ago, when I saw that, I went, okay, I get it. I get it now. Yeah. What, what stood out to you as the special or the, the tenderness? The, the level of presence. Um, yeah. The level of presence and, and how I demonstrated. And it's hard to talk about it because it's sort of like, I, it, you know, it, it's saying something positive about myself, right? Which is great. Know, like, as a culture, as a society, we don't often do. But it's like, MJ, you demonstrated being present with your mother and, and, and patient and kind and curious and regardless of what path, <laughs> you know, going on. And, and having a little distance from the video and seeing it again, it was like, okay, I get this. I get it now. So um, before, the, the, the takeaway for me was, wow, I mean, um, just experiencing those, those sweet moments in life and just cherishing them. And, you know, that's really special. And there's this whole other element of presence that was so incredibly powerful in that video. You know, like one of the things that really stood out to me, along with the presence, is you had so much grace and your mom did too. You, I think the presence that you're talking about is that you were present with her and that she was matching that. Yes. And uh, just the connection, even in the midst of not knowing, yeah. was so beautiful. And the other thing that strikes me is that because I work a lot with um, people who are caring for folks with dementia, mm -hmm. is that... Um, they call dementia the long goodbye. And so when there are moments like this where the person with dementia doesn't remember you, it's so, it can be so painful and it can be a layer of the grief process that gets like torn off. You know, it's just so raw and painful. And a lot of people talk with me about the, the grief when, they're, when their loved one doesn't recognize them yeah. and how just it's kind of like torture and that your experience with it, 
you were giving another view of yeah. what that could be like. And I, I wonder for you if you had that moment of pain and loss or um, because you seemed so in the moment. Yeah. It, yeah, that's, you know, in that moment, what I experienced was joy. And, and because my mother was so, I don't know, I didn't experience a sense of, of grief in that moment or a sense of loss. And I know a lot of people see that and think, mm -hmm. oh, how did she do it? How did she sit there? How did she not cry? Mm -hmm. um, because my mother was happy. I don't know. I, I think it's just that I've always wanted my mother to experience joy. And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is because I don't think I've really talked publicly about it is that my mother spent years of her life pretty isolated when she moved to Maine from Rhode Island and raised her family working in a factory. She did not belong in. She, my mother, she just, my mother is a ray of light and that light is something I, that, that light was quite dim for many years because of depression, because of isolation, because of anxiety. And so to see the, the, the shedding of the veil and the light coming out and shining for me was incredibly powerful in seeing my mom have joy. She retired from working in a factory for 25, 30 years to go take care of her own mother who had Alzheimer's. So she moved to Rhode Island and she lived with her mom and she took care of her mom and she couldn't travel. She couldn't do the things that she had set out to do, you know, before retiring. She couldn't do that. She had to take care of her mom. And while she was caring for her mom, she started developing symptoms of dementia. Oh. So I had spent many years as a child just wanting her to have a sense of peace and not have to struggle. And then for her, to, I thought when she retires, she'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And then she had to retire to go take care of her own mom. And she was isolated mm -hmm. still. So, and then to develop symptoms while you're caring for your own mom. And then your mom has to go into a nursing home because you can't care for her anymore because you have dementia. Mm -hmm. Oh, the so, tragedy. Yeah. yeah. The pattern and the tragedy. Yeah. <sighs> How old was your mom when she started to develop symptoms? Um, I found an email from my sister back in 2009. And um, it said, don't forget to ask the doctor about her memory. I'm concerned about her memory. Mm -hmm. And so I, it, she must have been, it must have been 2008, nine, you know, that mm -hmm. time frame. And then we got her um, assessed and, you know, she definitely had vascular dementia at that point. And uh, five, six years ago, five years ago, six, about six years ago, we had to move her back home to Maine. And um, so she really didn't get to experience her, her life the way she had envisioned because she would always say, when I retire, I'll do this. And so <laughs> someday she's going to be happy. And, um, yeah, she didn't, she didn't get that. But now she's so joyful. And it's like, you know, it doesn't always have to match what you thought it was supposed to look like. And it, you know, joy can come from other places. You know, it doesn't have to be from traveling. It can be from even just that moment of presence. And so there are a lot of moments of presence that I share with mm -hmm. her. And I see joy. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of through the lens of a little girl who just wanted her mom to be really happy, you know. What was your mom like when you were a little girl? My mom was, um, she was, she was a good mom. She was very dedicated to being with my sister and I. She also was a survivor. Um, you know, having worked in the factory, she was not happy. There was, you know, she, she was, there were, my dad worked there too, so they had each other and maybe one other deaf person, but nobody really signed, mm -hmm. so she felt isolated. So she would come home, I, and I would sense depression, you know, and I would sense her feeling anxious about things. Um, I don't think she ever felt embraced by the deaf community here in Maine because she didn't grow up here. She grew up in Rhode Island. So um, I saw a mom who loved 
to make bunny cakes during Easter, who love to make chocolate chip cookies and would let my sister and I lick the, you know, little <laughs> the batter. Thing. Yeah, the, yeah. And, and she was a mom who wanted everything to be fair for us. Um, she was a mom who genuinely, really, truly loved us. She had patience to the point of maybe being too passive, you know? And so she had these two kids who were sort of running amok and like taking control of everything. And she was just trying to manage that. And uh, yeah. she's kind and very, um, just very loving. And her, her big thing was, you know, it's okay. Even though I know there was a storm going on inside of her, you know, and she would just try to bring it down and bring it. It's okay. Um, she so, was so soothing, it sounds yeah, like. She, she was, yeah. She wasn't the mom who would go to your, your soccer games. She wasn't the mom who would go to your school play, even though she actually, no, she did. And th I think the reason why she didn't go to a lot of events is because there were not interpreters. So she was often just sitting, you know, so she would sometimes forget to pick us up at school. I mean, I think she was going through her own struggles with depression. She mm -hmm. would forget. You know, and we'd come home and we'd be knocking on the door and it would be locked because, you know, she didn't leave them locked for us or things like that. And I look back and, and, and think that was in part because of her, her own sense of being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And she was incredibly kind. You know, there was not a bad, she didn't have anything. Um, she just wasn't, she doesn't have a spiteful bone in her body. She doesn't have a, a hurtful bone in her body. She just wants goodness that's what she wants mm -hmm. you know wow so you know there's so many things are running through my mind about what i want to ask you because you have so many of the similar qualities you have um you know you, you've witnessed your grandmother and now your mom yeah. and now you're caring for your mom and your mom cared for her mom and there's this generational pattern in your family and you were in line yeah. and there's that and then there's a similarity there and then there's a similarity in your kindness and in your presence and uh it's just remarkable to me reflecting on that all of these um while you get the generational pattern of caregiving you also get the generational pattern of kindness and peace I and that. love. I feel that. That's what I witnessed with her taking care of her mother. Mm -hmm. She was kind, patient, gentle. That's what she is. She's gentle. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw that for many, many years mm -hmm. and, and uh, somehow internalized a lot of that. Thank goodness, you know, <laughs> because I, mean, I don't think any of us set out you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to take care of my parents someday. Oh. We don't think that. I thought I've been a mother since I was 19 years old going on 20. I thought, okay, when my kids are older, I, you know, I'm going to live my life and do all of these things. I never thought I would be taking care of my parents ever, <laughs> you know? So, so there was a little bit of struggle there for me. And then when I started to really remember what how she treated her own mom. I watched my aunts, you know, care for their mother as well. And it's like, okay, you can either resist this or you can embrace this. Which one is going to make you feel better here? You know? So how many years now have you been a caregiver? Um, she, we moved her back here. I started going to Rhode Island to help her out with her appointments around 2009-ish. And then we moved her back here uh, the same year I had my, my daughter, who's now five. So in about 2014. So it's been about five years since I've mm -hmm. really been, you know, having to monitor and having to make sure that bills were paid. And, you know, my sister and I really had a hands-on kind of uh, approach with her. Um, she did live by herself for about a year in an apartment when we first moved her back to Maine. But a lot of, we, we had hired a woman who's deaf to come help out. And things like that. So it's been, a, you know, five or six years. Mm -hmm. And from independent living to assisted living to living with you. Yes. Independent Whoa. living to meeting a man who she um, knew for many years. And so she developed this, this really nice um, 
friendship relationship kind of, uh, you know, dynamic yeah. um, moved in with him. And I think he started to realize, okay, her, yeah, she's really progressing. And I realized that too. And I said, this is this, we need to take over. And that's when we moved her into my house initially. And she lived with us for about a year or so before she moved into the memory care uh, assisted living facility and then back with us again. You know? uh-huh. How long has she lived with you this time? Since she, we moved her in December 28th. So, I mean, we're going on a year soon in December. Mm-hmm. Is she still in contact with her friend, the man that she lived with? She doesn't remember at all when she sees him. She she looks at him and, and I think sometimes she... She knows she knows him, but, but for the most part, she's totally forgot that mm-hmm. dynamic. She doesn't remember living with him, none of it. And to be honest, I'm glad because I think it was really hard for her, for us to move her out of there. That was a mm-hmm. really hard decision because I felt like I was ripping her away from something where she felt love, mm-hmm. felt loved and cared for. Mm-hmm. And I was pulling her away from that. Oh, and an independent life. Yeah, with connection and yeah, uh, intimacy, right? So now you, um, it's been almost a year that she's lived with you, and so how did you and your husband make that decision? Well, we <laughs> at this point in our life, it's just we have to do what we have to do. You know, we've, we've done it. We did it once before um, and we knew that it was necessary. And then, you know, something happened where we had to, we had to take his mom in too. And it's sort of like, you just do what you gotta do. And you try to make the best of it, you know, do the best you can. Because we're both, neither one of us are going to resist reality. Mm-hmm. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to be, you know, angry. We don't want to feel, you know, we want to live a good life, a happy life. So you just do what you have to do. That's sort of the motto in our house. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is incredible because it's hard to transition from having, you know, living a pretty carefree life to living a life of a caregiver is really tough. It really tough because now, I mean, he can't, we can't really go anywhere together unless we arrange for people to come to the house. And then we have to arrange because his mother is living with us too. And she has dementia. She's not deaf. My mother's deaf and, and needs access to communication, right? So if we hire a woman, you know, or somebody who's deaf to come into the home, then we're dealing with how is his, his mother going to communicate with this person? <laughs> So we have to think about all of those things. So most often it's just me going somewhere, coming home, and then he can go somewhere and we come home. <laughs> and maybe we'll have a date night. Highly <laughs> doubtful. You know, it's just oh. that really happen. God, yeah. Cause, and then not only that, arranging um, companions or caregivers for your parent, for your moms, it's also for your kids because you have a five-year-old. We have a five-year-old and thank goodness for my dear friend, Sarah Jane. She is a godsend and she has basically helped to raise our daughter. And uh, so she's been like the, the person who watched my daughter when I would go to work. So she's the person we would ask, you know, because she has a daughter and my, my daughter's good friends with her daughter. They're mm-hmm. like, we don't have to worry about that part. She's, she's always there. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So you have a village. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. But you're really in the sandwich. I mean, you're Completely. smashed right in between aging parents and kids. <laughs> and, and I think to myself, what's going to happen? I try not to project too much in the future, but what's going to happen when this is all done? Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by this is all done? When, Which part? You know, when, when I'm no longer caring for parents. Mm-hmm. I mean, as it is you know, we were helping to care for my dad by going to his home. He developed an illness and this was all happening at the same time. And then once he passed, it was like, whoa, space. What do you do with that space? I mean, of course, there's lots of things, things that can drop into that space, (laughs) but it was such a, um, whoa, uh, incredible, uh, feeling to, to not have that anymore. Mm -hmm. This has been such a huge part of my life now that 
you know, I, I, I wonder what it would be like. I mean, I don't know if I would experience that, that sort of crash and mm-hmm. um, depression or, or, or if I would just bounce right back and say, this is, this is life and we keep going. I mean, now, especially since that video, my mom, you know, she's been highlighted so much, you know, that I feel like in some ways, it's like she will leave behind a beautiful legacy, you know, mm-hmm. and it will be really tough because it's been such a huge part of our lives. Right. So I do wonder what that's like for what that's like for other people and what that will be like for us as a family. I'm sure it will be all of it. Oh, I'm sure there will be days that are crash and burn and other days that are uh, the memory of her is joyful. I'm oh, sure it will be all of it. That joyfulness that she brings into our home. <laughs> incredible. I mean, every, oh, every moment. Are there moments where she's not easy? The moments when she goes into the bathroom and <laughs> we need to use the bathroom. And it's like, <laughs> oh, no, she's in the bathroom. The light, we, yeah. we have a light on the outside and the light is broken on the ceiling and we have yet to replace that light bulb. So we have a light inside the bathroom. So the easy thing would be to fix the light bulb, right? To fix that light so we can flip so the you can light let her know. Room, you know, but instead we don't fix that, and we go. Oh, <laughs> we just go in the bathroom. <laughs> we all, hold, it, hold it. The shower upstairs is not working, and we're all like, "No!" It's become a running joke in our house. <laughs> no. <laughs> Jesus, so you hurry up and shower after she goes to bed. <laughs> oh my gosh! I get up. I get up at the crack of dawn, and I'm like in that shower. You know, we're all just like <laughs> in the bathroom before she gets up. I mean, the, the moments like that sort of funny but no she does not she, she's at a really interesting stage in this uh, you know with her dementia she's just happy all the time and accepting mm. and embracing and yeah mm. so now how did you how do you talk with your kids about dementia so you brought her to live with you when your daughter was four yes four right and she had already lived with us previous to that when my daughter was mm-hmm. But now that my daughter's four, I mean, I had taken her to go visit, you know, and um, so she knew that Mammy had dementia. She knew that she forgot a lot, but we finally reached a point. We had to look at her and it just came to me one day and I don't know how, um, but I said to her, because she was getting frustrated with my mother repeating the same questions, Mm -hmm. you know, where's mama? Where's mama? How old are you? What's your name? Who are you? You know, and um, she would just look at my mother like, I can't, you know, stop (laughs) now she just looks at her like you know and she's she's really (laughs) frustrated but i said to her alana she's like dory from finding Nemo." and you know i made the connection um i know now uh that i apparently that movie was purposefully you know i think it was purposefully created to create more awareness about dementia and alzheimer's maybe i mean by by casting dory as the the character who always forgot but in the, i didn't realize that you know i've seen the movie but i didn't realize you know that might have been some of the intent and maybe it wasn't maybe i just made that whole thing up i don't i like it i'll buy it <laughs> so but in that moment i said to my daughter she's like dory and then we just so when in moments she would get frustrated with my mother i would say dory you know she's like dory she can't help it she can't and it doesn't love it. a level of frustration but she started to understand it better you know mm-hmm. and it's hard for her um i think it's endearing at, in moments and in other moments it's hard and she just wants mommy to herself mm-hmm. She'll say, she's recently started saying, you like Mammy better. My mother oh. requires a certain, different, a certain level of attention that my, she requires eye contact. She requires me to be in the same space with her when we're having a conversation. She's lost her vision in her right eye. So, so she requires a certain, you know, kind of positioning. So I have to be really focused when we're communicating. And when my daughter's saying, mom, 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 and I'm trying to engage in a conversation and give my mom that moment of presence, and I have to hold, break you know, eye contact, hold on a second, and look at my daughter who's going, mom, 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 she's sensing that you know, struggle, me being in the middle, and she just wants to pull me away from it and, and have her mommy to herself. Oh, yeah. It's oh. 
Yeah. Oh, and then you're constantly in the middle. I'm constantly in the middle. And I think, well, I'm the adult. I can handle this. I'm the adult. She's the child trying to figure out, why can't I just have my mom to myself? So I have to be really conscious and aware of taking time with my daughter without anybody around, anybody. And um, that's hard. Oh, yeah. You know, and this, what you just shared, the moment you said, well, I'm the adult, I have to find a way to be steady in this. It reminded me of you describing your mom having this inner turmoil and still being soothing. And just going to... But I think, oh, and this is probably me reading way too much into it, but it's just. I don't think you're reading into it. I think that's exactly what it is. I mean, in, in those moments, it's just like, you just got to pony up, MJ, and you're just going to have to be the adult here. Because parts of me, I'm still that little girl, Coda, child of deaf adult. In those moments, there are moments that I'm that little girl, Coda, that little child of deaf adults is screaming. Why can't the world embrace sign language? Why can't everybody just sign? Why am I here to even bridge communication between my kids and my mom? Why? It, you know, and so I, I mean, screaming for the injustice, screaming for, you know, you know, the, 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 the frame in which, you know, the, the world generally views, you know, um, people who are deaf. And, and just screaming for everyone to just embrace each other and embrace communication and, and be accessible. You know, those are the things that come up for me in those moments because I truly have always been in the middle, you know, always kind of trying to be the bridge, you know, and even in my own family, in my own home, with my own children, because they mm-hmm. don't really sign. And, uh, for a number of reasons, for a number of reasons, because my mom was brought up during an era, you know, it was like um, people who weren't deaf, you know, sort of had all the power in, in decision making about, you know, what kind of communication, you know, or language you, you would decide to, to uh, expose your child to who was deaf. So should we use sign language or should we speak? Should we, you know, so that the, by and large, the majority community would say, you want to teach your kids to be like us, right? So my mother grew up feeling subservient, sub, um, just inferior to, you know, folks who are not deaf. And so as a result, I have my hearing children, she would speak to them. And I would say, you don't have to speak to them. You can sign and expose them. And she would say, no, they're hearing. I have to talk. Oh, That's sad to me. It's incredible. Oh, Yeah. And well, it's denying her. It's denying her to have a, a relationship that she could be developing with her grandchildren. It's denying my children that experience of, of being able to communicate freely with their grandmother and getting to know her and my father on a very deep level. Um, and it's just such a reflection of such a broken system. And it makes me really sad. And so all that stuff comes up for me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's not only broken, it's oppressive and it denies humanity to be fully engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Why are we not just embracing everybody as they are and, and, you know, however they communicate? Let's, let's, let's all be part of it. We're all in this together. And when I say that, we are literally in this together. Why are we dividing? Why are we separating ourselves from other individuals? Why? You know, why not embrace it? And so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I'm dealing, I deal with a lot of that kind of stuff. So you're bridging between your mom and your children, and you're also bridging between your mom and society because you've been interpreting for your mom and your parents for your majority of your life. Is that right? Well, I spent a lot of years in, as their interpreter. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, um, now it's different because I try to really make sure that there are interpreters at their appointments, but I still aid in communication, you know, mm-hmm. making sure that, that there's understanding and all of that. But yeah, I've been bridging my entire life, my entire life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, now you're bridging more, more than between hearing and deaf people. You're bridging life experience and from life to death and from 
illness to wellness. I mean, just that you're caring for two mothers who have dementia and Mm -hmm. are working on your own wellness. I mean, you're bridging so many worlds. It's just such an important thing to share. So I really hope people follow you and find you and we'll make it easy for them by linking in the, in the show notes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, it just is such a gift for me to, um, and such an honor for me and my listeners to get to meet you on a really personal and intimate level. I mean, you're just, your willingness to share some of the deepest experiences in life is just a beautiful thing. So thank you so much. Thank you. This has been truly an honor. And um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to share my story because I, I think it's just part of my, my journey right now. Sharing is really important to me. So mm. yeah. Isn't MJ a remarkable woman? And um, bonus, the experience with MJ is not over. So today, MJ talked about caring for her mom. But next week, MJ will be talking about caring for her dad at the end of his life. You don't want to miss it. So join us next week at the same time and same place for my next interview with MJ. As we wrap up, I wanted to share with you an important freebie that's something free I made for this episode. It's called Dementia 101, A Beginner's Guide to Dementia Disorders. In it, I describe what dementia is and isn't. I describe the phases of dementia and what to do if you're worried that your aging parent may have dementia. I'll link to it in my show notes. So take a moment to download it. It answers some of the most frequently asked questions I get about dementia. And don't forget to share this video with your friends who are caring for their aging parents because nobody should have to do this caregiving thing alone. Lots of love to you and your family. MJ and I will see you next week. Bye for now.